Thank you all for checking out this week's episode. Once again, I'm John. If you like what you heard and saw today, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And check out our brand new merch store with hats, coffee mugs, t-shirts, other cool stuff coming down the pipeline. Again, thank you all for support. Be safe and see you next week. How's it going, everyone? John here, the host of Spirit Talk. And today, uh, I get to welcome a guest I've been looking forward to, uh, Pierre Charette. Uh, Pierre uh, spent 33 years in law enforcement as a police officer, undercover detective, federal agent, and DEA special agent. He's also the author of a couple of books, uh, One Hell of a Ride, which is amazing. And I'm about to read the second one, One Hell of a Ride Part 2. So, uh, Pierre, it's uh, great to have you on here. Thank you so much, and I appreciate the, the invitation. And uh, I guess the reason why I reached out, and I know we talked about this before, um, I had this insane fascination with men and women that do undercover work. And we've had uh, Jay Dobbins on the show, Lou Velozzi, Bob Hamer. Uh, and I know, which we're going to talk about your friends, uh, Steve Murphy and Javier Pena, the Narcos guys. Um, it's, it's just the stories. It's like you pick it up. It's like this, you couldn't create a fake story if you wanted to with the lives you guys have lead, led. And with your work, everything from the French Connection to the Iron Curtain and everything you've done, which is obviously showcased in your books, uh, it's just surreal that here you are today to be able to talk about this and write about this. And it's just so inspiring. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. One of the things that I d did <clears throat> with both books, uh, One Hell of a Ride and then One, One Hell of a Ride 2, is I, I made sure that credit was uh, given to everybody that stood behind me. And it was a team effort. And also uh, the one thing that... I would not allow to be done uh, by myself was to enhance the stories. What you're going to read and what you have read, those are the real fact. This really happened. And there is no nothing to try to make me look better than anybody else. And I'm proud of that. And I got a lot of compliments from all my colleagues who have worked with me all over the world and said, you know, you, you gave credit and you made it a team effort. And we really uh, want to thank you and respect you for that. That's one of the reasons, obviously, your book, uh, but to go, when you look at like the Steve Murphy and Javier Pena stuff, the, the best thing about what I love the books, you just said it, it's the fact that we, yes, we were the guys that are undercover making the deals, buying the drugs, the dope, the guns and all this stuff. But the network you had around you, the team, the advanced team, the people on the ground that are uniform. And it's, it's kind of cool that you were able to do that because I think it would be so easy at your point to be like, well, I was this so-and-so the take down the French connection and this movie's about me and I'll get all this stuff. And it's the idea. And I guess we could start here, the value of teamwork and trust that comes with that, because it's something where you've been in a lot of situations yourself, where you could have easily been, shot and killed or whatever and here you are all these years later able to tell your story yeah uh you know it's uh when you work undercover and a lot of people some people it goes to their head and uh, it's all about me 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 i did this i i and i call it the i syndrome uh it's uh it is like you said teamwork and you got to depend on your team because you can get killed they're out there to spot, watch everything that's happening. And also there's various signals that are given, which undercover work, uh, if you're good at this trade, you have to be always focused, look around, watch for any signs and be able to uh, especially read body language. That's probably one of the most important part. And I, I whenever I teach or, uh, teach undercover work, I tell people, one of the first thing you need to do, if you want to get into this type of business, take a 101 acting course, because you have to be an act, an actor, and you better be able to sell yourself, otherwise you're dead. Was it tough? And was it tough for you in some of those moments where you, you, as you portray another like person or a version of yourself, when you weren't working, was it tough to kind of break from that character or vice versa? Like, how did you not bring a certain character home versus bring, a, maybe there's a fight at home with your 
significant other, your kid's sick, or you, you just hit your, your, you hit your three letter organization you're working for today. And how do you not bring that stuff back and forth to each place? Well, uh, some, some people that I've known and uh, also some uh, stories have been written about uh, people working on the cover that all of a sudden they become so al lax and amazed about what they've accomplished that uh, they become that person whenever they leave the job to go home and they can't cut loose of the character that they play. And that's a dangerous sign because uh, one definitely is going to end up in a divorce. And that person now this, his, the image he's portraying goes to his head and he actually becomes a character and can't shake it. So uh, you got to learn that you separate yourself. Once you leave the undercover uh, meeting, et cetera, you go back to the office and you don't go back acting like you were acting during that time. And you got to cut yourself away and know when to break that character. Otherwise, it's the end for you. Now, obviously, when it comes to like the researching or specifically towards like the French connection, like you have to start researching who's who and the power play of the drugs, the money and all this stuff. But with the research, was it fun for you to kind of create these characters who could fit in there because you know what's been done or what they're currently doing? Like how much how much leeway did you have personally to kind of create this character or did the DEA basically say, hey, this is your story. Make it look good. Uh, well, that's the one thing about working on the cover. If you're not on the cover agent, the, the first rule, and it should be uh, by any department uh, and any bosses, is that the undercover person makes the call. Gotcha. Uh, I had a very close friend of mine uh, back at, in 1973. Uh, he, he was working on the cover, Italian uh, person and working on the cover in New York against the mob. He was asked and told by his boss to, uh, that you know, you're know you gonna meet these guys, we have an informant, blah, 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 and you're gonna play the role. And he said, I don't like the sound of it and uh, I'm not gonna do it. And the boss said, excuse my French, the hell with you, right. you're gonna, that's an order. Well, he ended up getting killed at that meeting. And that's the first rule of undercover work that we try to teach people. And they should and say, the undercover agent calls the shot because he's the one that's out there facing the danger. The surveillance people are there to support him. Thank God, because I've been involved in shootouts and killing where uh, if I didn't have good surveillance people and all that, one of my agents would have been killed that day. And uh, so the undercover guy calls, calls the shot. He calls how it's going to be done. He picks the location, not the bad guy's location that they want to have in the meeting. That's the easiest part uh, to say. And you just tell him, uh -uh. it's under my rules. I'm the one that's purchasing this stuff. And you don't tell me, I'll set up the location place. This way you can pre-plan right? and you got the area cover. And it's always uh, what I used to do with my, my guys. And when I worked on the cover, we'd go for almost three days surveilling these people and watch their pattern of movement, who they met, getting their tag numbers, et cetera. Because if somebody shows up or you see somebody riding around, then you know, hey, they have people spotters. And now you have to play the game, but play it under your rules. Otherwise, you can be in deep trouble, get yourself killed, or somebody uh, that's surveilling could get killed. One of the cool things about your book is that you kind of you can you kind of showcase like yes the undercover work, but there's also local police and other agencies and stuff involved. And I guess the question to you is, say you are trying to take down someone in the mafia or a drug cartel or an arms dealer, whatever it is, and you're undercover with it. And when I say you, I say you represent DEA. What's the likelihood that some of the ATF is also undercover or what's the protocol to let other agencies know, hey, or even a local federal or state guy that's 
involved. How often do you ever come across where you're kind of like two people undercover and you don't want to get like a blue or blue type situation? Well, it should, you know, a lot. Uh, we've seen, uh, you know, when I when I joined uh, and when I was asked to join, because of uh, my French speaking experience, et cetera, eight years of undercover work, and sent to France, a lot of uh, a lot of cops or agencies. Unfortunately, this is where the dispute comes about, where they don't communicate with each other, and they want to take the credit for everything. That I always used to tell my agents, myself included, is that if we're going to work, I'll give you a quick example. If I was going to work, say, in Hollywood, Florida, meeting some bad guys, what I did is I contacted the Hollywood Police Department and the people in Broward County Sheriff's Department, and we brought them in to work with us. A lot of people say we don't need to work with other agencies. Or, or contact. To me, that, that has caused a lot of animosity between agencies. And uh, a, agencies should cooperate with one of them. Just because you're a federal agent doesn't make you the best in the world and you you shouldn't be a snob. There's certain agencies, I'm not going to name them, but certain agencies in the government, yeah. I think you know what I'm talking about, is that they will not share information and that's where the danger comes in, because the other person, the person you're meeting might be a federal agent from another agency, but they want to take all the credit so they don't contact anyone. And that's where you could end up in a shootout where cops kill cops. So to me, that's a bad policy. And uh, I've always had cooperation with every agency, French police, German police, Belgian police. And we brought them in immediately. We checked with them if there was any ongoing investigation. And that sh should be a policy and a must. First thing you do, contact the local agencies in that area where you're going to be doing this. Bring them in. And what I'll, I used to like to do is we'd bring them in. And whatever we seize, we gave it to them, cars, planes, et cetera, money, and help their resources and uh, I, get, I had more cases referred to me because of cooperation. That's the big word that yeah. a lot of federal agencies don't want to admit to. And I think a lot, the, the overarching thing you're talking about here is ego, too. I mean, it's like the downfall oh. of any civilization. It's like even these famous rulers and empires, they got so much hot air in their head that they just over a bit more than they could chew. And it, it's just aggravating because that stuff seems like it's so... You could be prosperous if you have no ego or just work together. Yep. I think it can't be that hard. But like you said, if you're taking down a big drug dealer or an arms dealer, it's like, oh, I want to have my name on that letterhead first. And it's like, well, hold on a second. The yeah. people, your your wife or husband at home that's watching the kids is just as much as part of this as it's just like you just all help each other. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I found that because – of good relationships and uh, putting yourself not above the local police and all that. You're a cop, and I don't care if it's a federal agent or you know, a cop is a cop, regardless of what agency he is with. And by working together, you get more accomplished than you'll ever have. And they'll, you'll, as a new agent, say in the undercover work, by doing that, your relationship. The first call they will say when they need assistance from the federal, it's going to be you. And they're going to work with you and all that. So good liaison can make fabulous call, uh, cases. And one of the biggest examples that I use was in my second book was Operation Southern Comfort. Southern Comfort was a $3.8 billion conspiracy from Pablo Escobar, U.S. mob, et cetera. I started that case with three people in Atlanta. We became the transporter for the U.S. mob, brought in, brought in over 7,000 kilograms of cocaine, picking it up directly from Pablo and a gentleman by the name of Harold Rosenthal, who was the broker for the U.S. mob. And we became their pilots, bringing shipment into Georgia. 
and we made the biggest cocaine conspiracy in the history of the United States. I started, like I said, with three guys. I brought in the local, the state agencies in, the, in Georgia, the Tennessee agencies, the cops in Kentucky, you name it. And by the time we got through, before we arrested everybody, I had close to 173 cops, local, God. state, and federal, working in seven different states on this case. I personally went to Columbia and removed Mr. Rosenthal from Medellin, who worked directly with Pablo, and I planned his removal for 12 days in Medellin secretly and brought him back to the United States. And the Attorney General proclaimed this was the biggest cocaine conspiracy in the history of the United States. Ross Perot honored all of us. And uh, unfortunately, uh, at that time, I had put in everybody in for the Attorney General Award uh, of making the biggest conspiracy case right. in the United States. And unfortunately, egos in Washington <clears throat> wanted us to put an individual's name on in that case who had nothing to do with it just to play politics. And I said, no. And they said, well, you're not uh, we're not approving your request for these people to be nominated for the Attorney General Award. That's, that was the biggest award that you can get in the Department of Justice. And guess who honored us was Ross Perot. And, uh, you know, and it was not a matter because the cooperation together can lead to big success. Right. And we all we did it together and we're, we were very proud of it. And now it's been considered uh, for possible movie right now. It's uh, yeah, the Ross Perot stuff. I hear a lot of stuff about him, too, where it's just like he was that one guy that was just very like he he got it right. Like he never got the the national appeal or like obviously uh Saturday Live would do the skits on him and he like he's kind of a goofy guy but he was like well like you always, the stories patriot. you hear yes like he's very pro-America but he also got and understood the sacrifices that men and women in law enforcement military it's such a fascinating now would you do if if you do like a prior case and then maybe it goes the uh Iron Curtain or French Connection or uh whatever it is do you ever look back at old cases and kind of be like, well, this worked this time. I'm not going to do this this time. Or do you kind of have to reset yourself before every ma major case besides bringing in your background on trading tactics and stuff like that? Oh, yeah. Uh, you you have to, uh, you know, uh, uh, after every case that we made, we had, I always got my team together and, um, and you know, I, and the guys knew it. And, and, and uh, I was very blessed. I had the great agents working with me and we worked as a team. And after every case, we always did a review together. And I and this is a, not a lot of bosses did this and it was not policy, but I, if I was in charge, Washington, stay out of my face, I'll call the shots. You don't, because you're sitting behind a, a beautiful right. desk in Washington. <laughs> so as a result, I used to tell my guys, look, you know what? We did this, this right. Next time, we're not going to do this because this happened, et cetera. And we didn't have our eyes perfectly open and watch for what was going around us. And I used to tell them, look, we made it. Now go home, write the report. I don't want to see you guys for at least three days. Have time with your family. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, you're on call. That didn't happen in a, even in my own agency. And everybody used to say, you know what? You know, the boss, you know, he treats us like he's one of us and they would break their back just to be with me and all that. And I had a lot of requests and I'm not trying to pump myself up. That's not me. I didn't want to write these books. Everybody kept calling me. We got to write your story. You got to write your story. So you do have to do reviews. What we did right, what we did wrong. Next time, we're going to do it the right way or make the corrections. Otherwise, somebody can get killed. Right. It's 
again, it's so crazy. And I love the fact that it's just, there's something sexy to it, right? Like undercover that the, you talked about the kind of the movie idea or this floating around there. I just think people are so enthralled by it because the sac I mean, outside the sacrifice and how patriotic it is, like trying to take down this thing that's, or this idea that's killing people or destroying lives. It's just, it's just so surreal. It's just you ever look back and you kind of be like when you after you write the books and you kind of you have a, a Sunday morning watch reading the paper, you just kind of sit back and just be like, holy crap, like I've been I've been involved with a lot of cool stuff that changed the outlook in the world projection at the time. Oh yeah. Uh, I think about it very often and I look back. Uh I was blessed with a talent that to me, God gave me a special talent. Yeah. I mean, for almost 13 or 14 years, I worked on the cover all over the world, behind the Iron Curtain, et cetera. And <clears throat> when I look back and uh, I said to myself, you know, I was very fortunate. I had the best guys in the world. And I, till this day, we stay in contact with each other. And I said to myself, you know, if I had to do it over, uh, over, I would do it over. But I was uh, blessed. Uh, and guys who work on the cover, most police officer or federal agents, a lot of them, will never experience that type of work throughout their entire career. Uh, undercover guys who make historical cases, et cetera. It's, it's a team effort. Some of them, they don't make it as a team effort. But it's it's a special talent that not too many cops will ever get exposed to this type of danger. I mean, I had people hold guns to my head, says so you're a cop, I'm going to kill you. Yeah. And uh, and guys were screaming, "Oh, Pete, the guy's got a gun to his head." And one of my best friends who died, who was a sheriff in Fort Lauderdale, Nick Navarro, he yelled out over the microphone. Now, at that time, he was a state agent. And he yelled out, don't anybody make a move. Pete will talk himself out of it. And then later on, we found out from the bad guy, he was a Puerto Rican uh, individual and out of New York who had come down to deliver some drugs to me. And uh, he, he mentioned that, you know, if he hadn't turned the entire assault on him back at me, I was con I was convinced he was going to yeah you know right. he was a cop and I was going to kill him because this was my third strike you're out I'm going to prison for life because he had been and uh, you know Nick saved my life that day and I did the same thing on one of my agents who was held at gunpoint working undercover and everybody says move in they got a gun on Chuck and all that and I yelled on the radio do not do anything. Chuck knows what he's doing. He'll talk himself out of it. Well, the guy had pulled a gun on him and they had attacked him from behind. And he was holding, I'll never forget, a Heineken beer in his hand talking in the parking lot at a bar with the bad guy. Well, we had followed them and saw them picking up guns that was delivered to them prior to after we had showed them the money. Well, Chuck just knew when and he got, looked around and caused a distraction, which is one of the things that how we, we know how to do that. Right. Get their attention away from you. And he smacked the guy in the mouth with the, uh, the beer bottle, a Heineken, and jumped over the car hood, got to the other side. I yelled, moved in. We moved in. Unfortunately, we chased the guy, one of the guys into uh, bushes that he had came out to attack Chuck from behind. And we end up killing him because he tried to shoot us, myself and two other guys. We were chasing him through the weeds. And uh, basically the driver had already just jumped into the car, was starting to go when I pulled up, jumped out of the car and I was coming at him and he reached up and pointed a gun at me and I had my Walter PPK and I just popped seven shots straight at him. But in those days, we knew yeah. cars, the plexiglass windows and the bullets didn't penetrate. That's when you slammed on the brake and took a dive. And, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, there's all these things that fall into place. 
and you have got to be on the lookout if you're working on the cover. It's mo one of the most exciting adrenaline rush there is. It's not because right. we're crazy, but that's the job. And uh, very few cops get the opportunity to, to experience that. And outside, and I've always, like, now you're here, I've got to ask this. When you hear of the, the term spy, like I kind of, I get what that means, obviously. But when it comes to undercover work, do the bad guys like Pablo Escobar or Iron Curtain or whoever these people, these high up people, do they ever try and infiltrate the police? Whether that maybe it's bribing, maybe per se, like the mafia would do, but they don't actually have spies. It's kind of tough to pretend you're a cop, right? outside of a copy like well you're not by in the agency like how does that ever happen oh yeah <clears throat> uh like on the french connection when i was working in france posing as a canadian mobster uh, <laughs> I love that. they had inf in infiltrated <clears throat> the uh narcotics bureau and we knew that there was corruption in the french uh, narcotics and heroin co was coming into the united states you know Unbelievable that the uh, Corsican mob was supplying 80% of the heroin uh, to uh, the United States. And that's why I was hired to go there because I spoke French fluently. Right. And <clears throat> we knew that, uh, you know, the cops have been uh, uh, tipping off the Corsican mob. They were getting paid. And it made it very hard for us to accomplish the goal to, to break up the French connection. So when I came to France, uh, they had uh, one of the directors in Paris, a DEA guy, uh, in those days it was called the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drug. He may have held a secret uh, press conference without telling the ambassador or DEA in Washington. And Jack, uh, his name was Jack uh, Cusack, God bless his soul, he's passed away, but Jack was a good friend and he, he had guts. And he held this uh, thing and said, we're unable to stop the heroin flow coming out of France because the French Narcotics Bureau is corrupt. And what happened? The president wow. of France threw him out of the country within 24 hours, dismantled the entire Narcotics Bureau and formed a new one. Well, they asked me to come to France and set up liaison and help set up and help break the French connection with our guys, five agents in Paris. And I did all the liaison with the French Narcotics Bureau. And yes, there was still some corruption. And one of the biggest case that we ever made, and I made it, um, I started the case, was uh, we got 20 kilos of heroin delivered in Paris to us at the train station. And <clears throat> the undercover people watching everything, uh, the director came over the radio and he says, move in, move in, arrest everybody. Well, I was supposed to get the consignment with my informant from the train station. And we were, he and I were going to go to Montreal and then go to New York and deliver it to the mob. Well, we interceded and arrested everybody. And when we got back to the office, I'll make this quick, is uh, <clears throat> Mr. Lamoille, who was the director of narcotics, great friend, and unfortunately he got re retired and got run over by a truck. He was like a godfather to me. He called me into the office and he says, Pierre, we need to talk, close the door. And I said, Mr. Lamoille, what's going on? He says, listen to this tape. And they were wire type tapping the Corsican mob uh, that was in Paris. And they heard over the phone, get out of there now, they're on to you. Wow. And when I heard the voice, I knew who he was. Oh. One of his one of his investigators. So we Jeez. arrested him. Yeah, we arrested everybody. Needless to say, this guy no longer worked narcotics or he went <laughs> to prison. And but what happened is uh, this shipment of cocaine was to be delivered to a, guy, a gentleman by the name of Herbie Sperling. He was the biggest heroin mobster in the U.S. mob in New York. And that's where we were going to be delivering this. And we we knew that there was some corruption you have corruption here in the united states 
Some of it still exists, not as much as it used to be. Uh, when I went to South Carolina from France, uh, I walked into a nest of eggs of corrupt political ah. figures, et cetera, and contracts that have me killed and my wife and my kids in Columbia, South Carolina by attorneys, senators, all got together and said, this guy Charette is getting too close to us. We're going to take him out. And one of the attendees on this meeting <clears throat> immediately called me at three o'clock in the morning. And uh, he was a good guy, not corrupt. And he was an attorney. He was a solicitor for Columbia, South Carolina. His name was Jim Anders. And Jim passed away now. But uh, he, uh, I went to his house at three o'clock in the morning. And, he's, and he was shaken and says, Pete, they're going to kill you. They're going to kill you and your family. And uh, we found out that the corruption was with police chief, sheriffs, political figures. The yep. chairman of the Democratic Party was involved in the biggest smuggling operation of marijuana in uh, Darlington, uh, South Carolina. We took it all down. I took down uh, attorneys, I took uh, senators. I've arrested people of a high position and uh, the corruption, is it still prevalent today? Yes, but not to the extent it used to be in those days. So we had to be very careful. Right. And, and, you know, we had to check any anyone that works narcotic. You know, that's one of the things that we do is, uh, you know, if we're going to work, say, with the uh, Dania Police Department, well, we do our homework. Is there any corrupt cops that we hear or have intelligence on? Right. And so you got to be careful and you check, make sure that the agencies you're working with, that there's no allegations of corruption or fear of possible corruption, because then you got to re really work secretly and trust the people that you're working with. When that phone call comes in at three in the morning, when you, after you hang up the phone, do you, is there any part of you where you're kind of like, why the, I'm, I'm a good guy here. I'm, I'm trying to defend this country and do what I do. And my own agencies or country people are trying to screw me and trying to get me killed. Do you ever sit back and be like, oh, what am I doing this for? Or is it you well, just, that one good person that talks to you and you save that life or get the guns off the street or the drugs off the street? Like that end of the day, that must be like, it's just, it's just, a, it's just sad to hear that. I hear Jay Dobbins talked about how his own agency, the ATF tried not giving him money or they tried setting him up. They weren't protecting him. And it's just like, all this work you've done up to your point in your life, and it's like you have people in your own town that were like, "We got to get rid of this guy." Yeah, well, uh, you know, you if you're in it in the business, what we were in, uh, uh, because there's not too many federal agency that operated like DEA. Right. Uh, I, I we were very blessed. We were a small agency, and uh, one agency called us, and uh, I remember in Time Magazine says, oh, yeah, DEA, we called them the cowboys. They're out oh, of yeah. control because we embarrassed them, and uh, not intentionally, but we put down uh, mobsters and mafia guys more so than that agency has ever done in its entire career, and there was jealousy. So... Uh, you know, uh, did I know I was risking my life? Yeah. And, uh, but I was dedicated. Uh, I felt like uh, it had to be done and that I saw what the damage that occurred to people that died because of heroin overdose. And I had made a promise. I'm going to get to the top of these bastards. Excuse my French. Yeah, I love it. And, uh, and I decided, okay, I'm going to go after them and I'm going to go to the top of the line. I'm not the street dealers, but I'm going to go for the big guys. And I did. And I was very blessed. One of the, another one of the good things in your book, I found like, obviously I had the preconceived notion that, Hey, if you're going after the cartels, it's probably drugs. Right. But some of your cases you worked on, it was fascinating to see like the higher ups working with the mafia, the cartels or the corruption, or, Hey, if you're working on a drug case, well, this is actually connected to a counterfeit rig or a trafficking rig. It's like in that underworld. It's like when you unravel something like that, 
is that when you kind of have to like make your team bigger or make some, maybe there's a, another agency or someone else in your department that's working on this trafficking rig, but now it's connected to what you're working on with drugs. Like what, how's that work? Because I, I know it happens. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, other uh, type of uh, uh, crime occurs at the same time. Yeah. And <clears throat> uh, when you come across that information, then that's when you contact the agency that's in charge of that type of investigation. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, our undercover office in France uh, had a secret service ne right next door to our office in a, in a secret type building. And uh, basically I came across and I, am, I was working a case and uh, my source, a uh, French uh, trafficker, uh, told me about a counterfeit ring uh, that was operating out of Paris but getting all their counterfeit uh, US dollars that they were uh, putting out on the market from England. So I called uh, my friend from Secret Service. And as a matter of fact, he became a movie director in Hollywood, Jerry Petovich. And Jerry wrote uh, To Live and Die in LA. In the oh, movie. wow. Yeah. And Jerry's a good friend of mine. I, I talked to him a couple of months ago. And uh, he was crazy like me. <laughs> And uh, so I called him and I said, P Petovic, I'm going to make you famous. And he goes, what's up, frog? And I says, here, here it is. Uh, I said, I got a source and he's on it and he's working with the uh, French mob and uh, they're doing counterfeit also. And I said, uh, I'm going to have you uh, give him to you and you guys can work the case. And they did. They went to England with him and they broke up the biggest counterfeit uh, case ever made in Europe and made Jerry famous. <laughs> and uh, so we do share that type of intelligence when, when we come across it. And usually what will happen is that that agency, if they're handling, a, say, customs or whatever the case may be, even the FBI, uh, you know, we will refer to them, but we work jointly with them and help them out with that case. And everybody ends up looking good. And there was uh, cooperation. Good liaison leads yeah. to more uh, uh, success than bad liaison. Right. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a different world, uh, you know. And uh, I, uh, when the FBI came into play, to now given the authority to work narcotics cases they before we were the only agency and customs was the only border agency and uh, you know i was asked along with another agent a friend of mine and along with other agents throughout the united states we had to train the fbi on how to work narcotics case and for three months we went to the fbi office and held school and Believe it or not, and I'm not exaggerating, they were in awe. They couldn't believe that we we did all these crazy things. And I had a lot of good friends, FBI agents, said, saying to us, you know, you know, you guys are unbelievable. You know, we're lucky if we work two cases in our entire career. We don't do undercover work. And we said, you know, well, that's the difference. Our job. Right. Is undercover work. You know, now, so. when you 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 talked about your book, obviously working with informants and that relationship with informants, do you ever get? Not, I'm not gonna say too close to informant, but obviously there's a sense of trust there, right? They know what you know, what they're doing, and they can't get trouble from their thing. Their person they work for is illegal. You, the relationship you harvest with an informant after the case goes away and whatever the the deal is with the informant. Do you ever, are there any times you're kind of like, this is this is actually a really good person that just got mixed up in a terrible crime? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I have, till this day, I still have inform ex informants. <laughs> awesome. Uh, they, they call me at Christmas time. <laughs> hey, Pete, Merry Christmas and all that. And uh, some inform, there's two types of informants. There's the one that was involved in the criminal activity. He decided to flip himself over to, for, to so he wouldn't have to serve uh, of course. the entire time, and uh, that type is you know is is a criminal informant, 
and uh, you work with him, but there's uh, there's a line, and you try not to cross that line and become very friendly. Some some agents have gotten in trouble with uh, with informants; they get too close up. But then you have a professional informant. Uh -huh. That's a guy like you, myself, yeah. etc. And uh, those guys, you stay in touch with them. They believe it, and usually professional informants, uh, they'll um, come to you because one of their family members got involved and they got in trouble and uh, they want to make sure that that person that got them involved and put them into that type of work uh, is punished. And I had uh, a doctor and also an accountant from uh, uh, Boca, uh, Bolivia, and the doctor was Ochoa's doctor in Medellin. Wow, yeah. And his uh, niece died of cocaine overdose. And one day, my secretary says, uh, some uh, two people here want to meet, would you meet, Pete? And so they came in and introduced themselves. And they told me that uh, the doctor told me, he says, uh, I'm uh, Ochoa's doctor and my niece died because of his drug. And I want to have you, we've read about you. I want you guys, you to take them down and we will bring in shipments and tell them that we have contacts here that want some stuff. And they did, they worked with us the best in the world. And even the agency, as I refer to them, yeah. the agent, everybody knows what they are. Yeah. Uh, they wanted to speak to uh, my sources. And I said, uh, my, my boss had called me in the office and I said, no, no, they will never come close and they will never meet these people. And they got insulted and all that. I said, you can call the president of the United States. I could care less. You're not meeting them and I, you, we're not introducing you to them. Well, I had them go to Colombia. They uncovered the first heroin field, poppy field. Wow. And brought in, brought to me directly samples of their heroin. Everybody in Washington said, no, that's just rumors and all that. I said, guys, I'll prove you wrong. And I did. And we uh, then with Steve Murphy from Narco, Steve, I sent him to Columbia. Steve worked for me. And uh, and my, I got him the job in Columbia, and I told him, I said, I just want you to do one thing for me, see. He says, Boston, name it. I said, get that SOB, Escobar, find them. And he did. Yeah. And he, Pablo got killed. And uh, Steve now is very popular with Netflix and it does appearance. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's... Um, it's it's a crazy world, uh, but the profession of DEA agents, uh, I would say probably 50, maybe 40% of them work undercover on a full-time basis, and they get the reputation that, you know, and they're sought after for help, and uh, the rest of them, they work like money laundering cases and all that. Some of them, it's not everybody that's, uh, you know, uh, born to be an undercover guy. And, uh, but uh, DEA had corruption at one time and the old bureaus, et cetera, bribes that were being paid. And in my, since 1973, uh, all of us that I know is that as soon as you heard that maybe there's a, corrupt got agent, everything stops. We go after him and we make sure that we verify it. And if he is, he's going to prison for 35 years. Right. So we didn't put up with corruption. There was corruption in the agency, but then it changed. And uh, I was very proud. And someone wants to get into that type of work. DEA is the place you want to go. Because if you like excitement, every day is unbelievable excitement. Most agencies don't have that excitement. Now, when you retire, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think there's really a civilian agency that does undercover work, right? So will these yeah. other, will the police departments or maybe the DEA or other three-letter agencies, will they bring someone like you to help train as like an instructor? Like, how does that work? 
Because obviously oh, yeah. your tactics stood the test of time. Why not still pick this guy's brain, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I do some uh, uh, teaching at academies, uh, undercover work and all that. And uh, so, uh, yeah, we uh, when we retire, we're very sought after by various companies, et cetera. And uh, I do uh, still I do some consulting. And uh, as a matter of fact, I just um, uh, did a, uh, a security detail in Ireland for one of That's the awesome. richest man, one of the richest men in the world, and uh, was his bodyguard and his family uh, for uh, ten days. And uh, so uh, we branch out, and um, I was doing a, a lot of teaching at academy, et cetera. And uh, I believe in it, and I'm still doing it. As a matter of fact, um, uh, DEA, there's going to be, uh, I don't know if you're aware of the Mob Museum in, in yes, Las Vegas. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, uh, the Mob Museum contacted me, and uh, they're going to have two display uh, of my cases and in the Mob Museum. One will be on the French Connection, and the other one is going to be on Operation Southern Comfort, which was the biggest cocaine conspiracy. And now they have just reached out, and I'm going to go there as a guest speaker for the new DEA Museum. It's awesome. Uh, for the ri ribbon cu cutting. So, uh, you know, we, we do branch out, and uh, a lot of people get hired and are sought after uh, for positions with local uh, department. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we're, we have had unbelievable type of experience because we experience, you know, homicides, uh, you know, robberies, et cetera. It all comes in and somehow it's tied into narcotics. And so we get a, a complete volume of various type of cases. So now, it's an exciting job. When it kind of leads into that, I know the last couple of years with the whole movement to anti-law enforcement sentiment and people retiring and quitting because they don't want to deal with the media or just the negative onslaught. And this isn't taken away from the actual bad cops or the bad people that um, deserve what they have coming. But for you, if you were a 20 year old right now, like how would you look at law enforcement today, how it's viewed? And would that deter you from having serving 33 years in law enforcement, or like it even a step further, the recruitment process now for law enforcement, whether it's state, local, federal, what have you seen that they're maybe they're doing well or not well enough? Because you have to start replenishing these people that are retiring with young kids that want to do this stuff. Well, you know, what, what's happening, it, it's a shame that it's happening and uh, law enforcement, uh, the stigma that has been placed on them, uh, by the uh, various uh, groups, if you want to call them that. Uh, it's, it's a shame and it discourages some people from wanting to pursue that type of career and saying they're not getting the support. People hate them. They're shooting cops, et cetera. I blame it. And I'm the first one to admit it. And uh, I've been around for 33 years in law enforcement. And what I saw was people say, well, why is this happening? Why uh, is this uh, hatred ag against cops? You know, this been, we made it happen. Yeah. And what's happened, and I don't know if you would agree with me, but I started watching, uh, I always follow, uh, watch laws and et cetera, and, and yeah, of course. I, I improve on it and all that and teach it. Uh, back in the 60s uh, and uh, 70s, when we were arresting people with, say, two kilos of cocaine and all that, we had judges and magistrate, no bond. And then if you were convicted, 25 years in prison. Yeah. And even at the state and local uh, 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 judicial uh, uh, branch, uh, we had judges on the benches that, I mean, they were severe and they read the law the way it was supposed to be. Then we started seeing all, all of a sudden a bunch of judges who were possibly raised up in the hippie generation, et cetera. And they did not start applying the judicial penalties like they were supposed to and what the law calls for. 
if you get arrested for smuggling cocaine in from South America and all this, 25 years in prison. Well, now they say, well, this is your first offense. I'm gonna let you go on probation. And then you have the, the repeated offenders doing the same thing over. They have a, a you know a, a rap sheet that, that is maybe three, four, five, ten pages long. And judges keep, I blame ju the judicial system. And that's my personal feeling. And I would say it right to their face. Yeah. You are not interpreting the law the way it's supposed to be. And there is a statue nationwide. And I used it against the state attorney in Florida. And I called her bluff because she didn't want to try <laughs> conspiracy cases. And I told her, she was a great lady. She says, it's too time consuming, Pete. And I had just come back from federal narcotics training school. And I said, I told her, Angie, I said, let me tell you, I learned about conspiracy. And I said, I have a conspiracy case right now for heroin all over Broward County, Fort Lauderdale, Palm, uh, West Palm Beach, you name it. And I said, I've got 14 guys that I've been buying heroin from, and it's all a conspiracy. Conspiracy is very simple. People say, well, co conspiracy, big word. No, two or more people agreeing to commit a crime. That's all yeah, it takes. Right. That's a conspiracy. So as a result, I had I had I used to sit with the Florida law book and watch all the type of violations that people commit. And I told her, Angie, you know, it's on the book. I says 15 years automatically. Nope, we're not doing conspiracy here in the solicitor's office. So I went over to the state attorney's office, who and he was a good friend of mine. And I went upstairs and I told him, I said, look, I'm having a problem. He goes, what's the problem, Pete? And I told him, Angie won't uh, pr uh, prosecute this case. It's a conspiracy. I gave him all the facts. He says, absolutely. I said, here's what I want you to do for me. Go have a talk with her and tell her that Pete's going to take it out in the arrest warrant for you. And he looked at me, he goes, Frenchie, what are you doing? I said, no, no, no. I said, here, read this, malfeasance and misfeasance of office. That law, if you look it up, is in every state. And I've told cops, I've even did some publications on Facebook to cops and said, if you're chief of police, your sheriff, your captain says, do not enforce these guys who are looting and breaking through the stores and causing fires and all that and watch them just take uh, people's property. Yeah. I said, if your captain says, hey, the mayor says we got to back off and these people let them burn down or steal jewelry stores and all that. I said, you guys, and I put it on Facebook malfeasance and misfeasance of office. And I told them, the law says that a note that you take to protect and serve the citizens of yeah. this country, the laws are there. And if someone gives you an order and says you're not allowed to enforce this or arrest them for bur uh, entering burglary with force, etc., I said, then you look at them and say, chief, I'm advising you that I will enforce the law. And if you try to stop me, I will take out a warrant for your arrest for malfeasance and misfeasance of office. One of the simplest case. And Angie, we told him, and I, I came down with the state attorney and he says, Angie, Pete's right. And he says, we got a judge right now ready to sign uh, for a warrant for your arrest for malfeasance and fees. And that's the same thing with these judges and all this. They have, they're not reading the law properly. Right. They're interpreting the law to fit their own need and make it look like they're very sympathetic. That's where we have the problem. And you've noticed that too, a lot of these high profile cases on the left and right, where it's like they'll pick and choose what part of the law they're going to interpret, or they'll interpret it in a way that makes you look good. If you and I yep. are presented with the facts of a case or see a crime, we can interpret that whether we the criminals actually innocent or the bad guy is actually good or the good guy is actually bad. It's like, it's how you interpret it, right? It's like, 
Right. And even if conspiracy did take weeks and weeks and weeks of work, it's still your job to do that work. Why yeah. take the oath of office? It's weird. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and one of the best uh, excuses that they use, well, if you arrest one of us, you're a racist. <laughs> no, it's I'm not true. a racist. I, I have all friends of mine that are Chinese, they're black, et cetera, Italian. You know, I'm a French Canadian. Does that mean that I have to say, you got to call me an American French Canadian? No, we're all Americans. Yes. That's the bottom line. Right. And people are not uh, standing behind law enforcement. All they have to say is the law is on the book. If you don't like it, too bad. And if a judge is allowing people after they've been arrested 15 times, who's who's causing this problem? It's not the police officer, it's the judge. He should be removed. They should vote him out of offices. And I think we could get back to good law enforcement and stop all this. When you people go and destroy property, if you own a store and they're stealing your jewelry and breaking the door down, and police officers are told, just fold your arms and don't do nothing. No, then you're not doing your job. Right. I don't care if it's I don't care if it's the president of the United States. I'll tell them that you know what? You're going to jail. Yeah. You know, so we caused our own problem when it came to this embarrassment to law enforcement. You got great cops out there and they're trying to do the right thing, but they're being told not to. And I told them on Facebook, arrest your bosses for malfeasance and miss watch how quickly things turn around yeah well pierre this has been awesome um i know i've, I've already read your first book the second one's actually a couple days away from being shipped to me but if anyone wants to read this book i found this obviously on amazon uh if people have questions whether it's to follow you and stuff is there go to your website right yep. and just go to uh, my website check it yep. out uh, exactly. And, uh, you know, I, I'm available, uh, you know, uh, if people uh, want to want to have me appear and uh, and speak to uh, speak for them and all that. I do with public uh, appearances and stuff like that. And now I've been doing podcasts like and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. But, you know, it, people have got to realize that law enforcement is there to protect you. And, that, and to also uphold the Constitution. Right. And that's what we're doing. Was there corruption? Was there bad cops? Was there racist cops? You no. darn right there was. Yeah. But now it's gone above and beyond that. Now cops are saying, you know what? I'll just go in, collect my paycheck, sit back and watch crime happen because my boss says you can't enforce that. They ought to go to jail for what they're doing and allowing. Well, I got, I, I work for the mayor and, uh, you know, I could jeopardize my job if I, if I don't do what the mayor, arrest the mayor for telling you you can't enforce your laws. That's all there is to it. And watch how quickly things will turn. Yeah, so it's just unfortunate that it gets it has to go that route. But you know what? You're there to do your job, do it. So this, yeah. uh, this has been awesome, Pierre. Again, thank you for your time and thank service. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll have to do it again after I read the uh, second book. Second book is you're going to see a surprise. Uh, it, it is uh, it's not as big as the first book, but the, the first book covers the French connection behind the Iron Curtain, where I, me and my guys uncovered the first heroin lab, uh, lab in the country. But the second book, it's an eye opener. You're talking about three point eight billion dollars worth of cocaine that we and we broke the mobs back on that one. So it was exciting. And they, I had the best team in the world. Awesome. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you so much. And I look forward to meeting you also. Oh, hello. I'm just enjoying this nice fucking candle. Anyways, I'm John, the host of Spear Talk. And I want to talk to you about nice fucking candles. We are lucky to have nice fucking candles as a sponsor of the podcast. And if you use code SPEARTALK15, you get 15% off your first order. Or use the affiliate link below to always get your candle needs through Nice Fucking Candles. Nice Fucking Candles are 100% soy wax. They have a 65 hour burn time, maybe more, if you uh, nurse the flame a little bit, maybe. I don't know, I'm not an expert on flames uh, or candles, but I will say these things burn a long fucking time. 
You ask me about the wick, it's a double wick for even burning, which is amazing. And uh, they come in three incredible flavors. Uh, I'm not sure if you're gonna be eating these candles, but if you do like them, the scents are eucalyptus and ginseng, tobacco and fireside, and seaside and driftwood. Once again, uh, nice fucking candles. They are the candle company for Spear Talk. And if you love candles and need a good scent to clear out your office, your room, your podcast room, your weight room, uh, your whatever you're doing in a room that smells like crap, use this candle. It's amazing. Thank you. Check them out. Love nice fucking candles.